This program contains graphic material, including offensive language. Viewer discretion is advised. They are outlaws, old school bandits. Whenever we went anywhere, people moved out of our way. They were scared. Put it this way, yeah, we bad. They're the most violent motorcycle gang in the West. You're in the sun, you're not. You're not nice to people. It's the way we are. These gangsters have one true enemy, the law. Everywhere I would go, I was being followed. Now, the Sons of Silence are uniting in rebellion. If we all joined forces, every club, every chapter in the nation, they'd have to bring in the army to cool us down. Colorado Springs, Colorado. This is a military town, home to the Air Force Academy and the Army's Fort Carson. It's clean, green, and beautiful. In 2006, Money Magazine named Colorado Springs America's best place to live. But amid the beauty is the outlaw motorcycle gang, the Sons of Silence. There were too many times that I've seen people come up and uh, get in brothers' faces and say, you guys think you're tough, don't you? Wrong thing to say. I no wonder why they got beat up. The Sons are one percenters, a criminal brotherhood that's proud of its outlaw image. They do not follow society's laws. Types of crimes that the Sons of Silence are involved in over the years has ranged from murder, burglaries, robberies, drug dealing, gun dealing, prostitution, you name it, they've been involved in it. It's all fun one-on-one -on -one until you swing in the sun. Nick Nichols, an Army veteran, rode with the Suns for a decade. Growing up, he was constantly moving, so Nichols was drawn to the gang for its stability and sense of family. It looked like the guys were close, like there was a brotherhood, like they would do anything for each other. When Nichols first joined in 1988, it was because he liked drugs, liked to party, and he liked easy women. The girls I liked were dancers. The reason I like dancers is you got to see what was in a package before you ever got it home. Big Larry asked to have his identity concealed. Whenever somebody does not get out of our way, we will them up all the time. Big Larry is a longtime member of the Sons of Silence. He won't reveal when he first joined, but admits that originally he considered it a stepping stone. I wanted to be a Hell's Angel. I figured I'd get into one club, work my way up. When he became a son, however, he lost interest in being anything else. Why go to that level? Because we're there now. Our time is coming up. They have 36 chapters worldwide, but the majority of their members live in the western U.S. The Sons are one of the fastest growing motorcycle gangs in the world. Colorado, Iowa, Minnesota, Indianapolis, Illinois, anywhere. Where our territory is, is us. Us only. We will try to take over. That's what we do. They are pathologically anti-authoritarian. Beat their ass in the home like a little girl. The sons are known to traffic in weapons, stolen bike parts, and drugs. The main drug of choice in a club is speed. There were times when I was awake for three or four days at a shot. 
we sell a lot of cocaine, but our drug that we sell most of is crystal meth, because that is our money. The Sons are careful to keep their criminal activities separate from club business. A lot of brothers are pretty secretive about what they got going on. They could be involved in stuff that other brothers have no idea about. I've always done crimes by myself. That way I know who's going to snitch on me. They learned this lesson the hard way in the late 1990s when they were infiltrated by the ATF. I had a gift for Gab, you might say, and I wanted to use that. Blake Bodler asked to have his identity concealed. In 1997, this ATF undercover agent was transferred to Colorado Springs. He was young and eager to take on a challenging case. The one group that stood out as being the criminal element in Colorado Springs was the Sons of Silence Motorcycle Club. They had a reputation for violence, and many of the potential informants I spoke to referred to them as the Sons of Violence instead of the Sons of Silence. Jim Waddles, then a detective with the Denver Police Department, had been tracking the Sons of Silence for years. If I didn't know who a guy was, I'd walk up, hey, I'm Jim Waddles from Denver Police Department, what's your name? Waddles operated in the open. They always saw him coming. I says, would you rather have me standing here in front of you or sitting across the street watching you in binoculars waiting for you to do something stupid? The Sons have a severe code of secrecy. Developing informants within the club was extremely difficult. Blake was the answer to the problem. So you go in, in what we would call a cold call situation. You don't have an informant or anyone else vouching for you uh, that you're a good guy as far as the criminal world goes. So you have to go in there and earn your own stripes. Blake started calling himself Bo and began hanging out at the biker bars around town. He was invited to a Sons of Silence party at the gang's clubhouse. Things were going well until he made a mistake. His first party was going very well up until the time that I observed uh, a hang around retrieve a gun from behind the bar. I told that hanging around, I said, that's a nice gun. Let me know if you ever want to sell it. Blake was a stranger trying to illegally buy a gun, and the sons were on to his game. A few minutes later, he called me out front, and at that time I was confronted by two Sons of Silence members. They took him outside the clubhouse, pushed Blake into the shadows, and began interrogating him. And they wanted to know who I was, what I was about, why I was there. He was going to get his butt kicked that night. Blake insisted he was just trying to party. But the sons weren't buying it. I knew when he said, get out of here, leave, he wanted me to leave the property. The agent knew that if he let the gang chase him off now, he might never get another chance. So he took yet another risk. And I saw an opportunity to go back into the bar and maybe mend some fences. And that's the route I chose to do. The club's enforcer immediately took notice. A few minutes later, Frank Pearson, who was an enforcer for the club, came back into the bar, and he saw me sitting there. And he came walking up to me, and he said, what are you doing here? Blake had to think fast. And I said, well, got out of his sight. Can I buy you a drink? And Frank looked at me for a couple of seconds, and then he said, yeah, buy me a drink. So in a way, Frank admired the fact that I stayed around. Blake had passed his first test. He would eventually become a fully patched in member, privy to the sun's hidden world of crime. I no longer had to justify why I wanted to buy a gun or why I wanted to buy meth. You're immediately confirmed as part of a criminal element. And Blake would soon learn the Sons of Silence show no mercy when it comes to their enemies. 
better for you people to stay the f*** away. If you do not go away, we will break your legs and your arms, or we'll kill you. Colorado Springs is the suburban American dream. It has no ghetto and little crime. The crime it does have usually involves the Sons of Silence, a gang that rules through intimidation. Any disrespect, you jump, you take care of business. Somebody f***s with your brother, your brother never hits the f***ing ground, you take him out. This is the way of the Sons of Silence. The gang has been around for 40 years, but few members know the origins of the club. In my book, it could have been God that started the Sons of Silence because the Sons of Silence are the best club out there. The founder of the club is a reclusive 69-year-old named Bruce Richardson, known simply as The Dude. Many members don't even know he's still kicking. I'm the dude, and I'm alive and well. In 1968, the dude was just out of the Navy and living in Longmont, Colorado. He and three biker friends were looking for something to do. One day, we're sitting around drinking a beer, and said, you know, said, what do you guys think if we start a little club? They were all for it. So that's where the Sons of Silence come from. They chose a name that summed up their main goal, secrecy. I just wanted to be just a bunch of guys that could get together. Not everybody know our business. It's sort of like uh, the mafia does something, right? They don't advertise it. Then they design the club's colors. Their inspiration came from a classic American institution. We were drinking Budweiser beer, and I seen the emblem, and I says, hey, better make a good one. We live in America, big A, you know. The only thing that was really missing um, off the Budweiser symbol was the star on top of the A from the original Budweiser logo. These here were made in 1969. National chapter. Sons of Silence. Underneath the symbol was a Latin phrase. Domic non separa. Uh, that sort of means like, uh, we don't part till we're dead, till we die, you know? <laughs> the new club put on their emblem and began riding. At first, they stayed out of trouble. The criminal activity of the Sons of Silence in the 1960s probably amounted to uh, some fighting, some beer drinking, and pot smoking. What well, young man ain't rowdy. <laughs> Been there, I know that. <laughs> the club had an intimidating image, especially in Colorado, which didn't have motorcycle gangs. <laughs> It didn't take long for word to spread. Soon, bikers across the state were starting their own chapters. More popped up in states like Iowa and Kansas. These new members weren't just interested in being rowdy. They were ready to rumble. We're bikers. We're the outlaw. We're the best of the best. Because we make our own laws, our own rules, and we go by that. There are kind of social misfits. These people want that intimidation. You can put that patch on their back and walk around the streets and intimidate the public. As the gang grew, it became more organized. The dude was named national president. The sons also became more lawless. In 1971, tensions between the Sons and local law enforcement finally erupted. There was a uh, group of Sons of Silence members who had been indicted in Colorado Springs on conspiracy charges to um, kidnap and murder uh, the wives and daughter of a police detective. 
the dude claims a police captain was giving the Colorado Springs chapter trouble and says he tried to have a calm sit down to work out the differences. They would give me a bunch of shit. And I just said, well, I'll just pull in everybody from every chapter into this town, see how you like that. It scared them. And they come up with an idea that we was gonna kidnap their wives and rape and pillage and all kinds of bull The conspiracy indictment was dropped when the witnesses to the case skipped town. The gang remained on the law's radar and found their quality of life compromised. Everywhere I would go, I was being followed. Law enforcement, everywhere. In 1974, the dude made a decision. He was out. He turned the club over to new officers and rode off into the sunset. The suns continued to grow with chapters established in seven states. They began battling with other motorcycle clubs over drug turf. In Indiana, they were clashing with the outlaw motorcycle gang, who saw them as newcomers. In March 1980, the outlaws invited the sons to a party at their clubhouse. The peace proposal didn't go as planned. The outlaws told them to take their guns off. The Sons of Silence felt disrespected. They weren't allowed to bring their guns into the Outlaws Clubhouse, and they refused and left. The Sons decided to take action. Some calls were made back to Colorado. Uh, the word I got was they were told to air condition the house. Five members of the Sons went back to the Outlaw Clubhouse and opened fire. The outlaw's national vice president, Thomas Satan Reeves, was shot in the head and killed. This ATF surveillance video shows longtime Suns member Steve Cresson claiming to be involved in the murder. Despite the apparent confession, the ATF never prosecuted, and no one was charged with the murder. The Sons of Silence declared war on the outlaws and began to hunt them down. If any outlaws came around here or we were somewhere, we were supposed to take care of them. How deep is the love for your mother? That's how the hostility is between Sons of Silence and the outlaws. The outlaws sought their revenge. In October 1980, two Suns members were fired on while riding their bikes with their girlfriends. One of the women was killed. In August 1990, tensions came to a head at the Sturgis Biker Rally in South Dakota the most famous biker gathering in the world. It was the 50th anniversary of the rally, and the outlaws, who rarely attended, showed up in force. We knew the outlaws were there. Everybody was in orders to travel in groups to avoid any kind of conflicts. We were ready to fight if we had to, but we weren't going looking for it. Nick Nichols spent most of his time looking for women. Other sons were looking to kill outlaws. And they found what they were looking for. The outlaws were in a, in a bar on Main Street in Sturgis called Gunners, um, getting along, drinking. Um, two Sons of Silence members start to go in. And an outlaw confronts them at the door, says, can't come in here. And they basically said, yeah, we're, gonna, we're coming in. They're just two of the people that like to go out and start the battle was on. The outlaw was shot, and the two sons were stabbed before fleeing on foot. And the uh, Sons of Silence jumped over the motorcycles, got into the middle of the street, and ran several blocks down the street uh, where police found them. 
Leonard J.R. Reed, who had been the Sun's national president for a decade, started to think the war with the outlaws was misguided. J.R. wasn't looked at as a violent man. He was more of a calming effect, if anything. He tried to solve problems with other clubs, with diplomacy, as much as he could. Reed believed that law enforcement was the Sun's true enemy, not the outlaws. I mean, the feds would love it. I mean, like I say, whoever doesn't die, they get to arrest. The law enforcement agencies don't think we have a right to f***ing exist because we're bikers. In the mid-1990s, JR started the Colorado Confederation of Clubs to try to stop the biker wars. Nick Nichols was the co-chairman of the organization. I believed in what was going on and what we were doing because they all want the same thing. They want to wear their patches, they want their little slice of the pie, and they want to be left alone. Big Larry saw the Confederation as a show of force. If we all joined forces, every club, every chapter in the nation, they'd have to bring in the army to cool us down. J.R. Reed's Confederation succeeded in ending the war with the outlaws. But it didn't succeed in getting law enforcement to lay off. By 1997, ATF agent Blake Boatler had infiltrated the Colorado Springs chapter and was prepared to take the gang down. That became a challenge to me because the Sons of Silence consider themselves the baddest of the bad. Colorado Springs. The outlaw motorcycle gang, Sons of Silence, runs this city through intimidation and force. The club's rules are its doctrine, its patch, its most sacred image. I love my mother. I would do anything to keep my patch on my back. I would damn near kill my mom to keep it. To get his patch, a biker has to go through a rigorous rite of passage designed to weed out the weak. Before a biker can become a member, he must be a prospect. As a prospect, you're required to do whatever a patchwork member tells you to do. The Sons of Silence take no mercy on their prospects, hazing them relentlessly. The Sons of Silence are kind of a throwback in the outlaw motorcycle game world. Uh, they like to punch the prospects in the mouth, headbutt them, kick them, do those kind of things, and just run them hard. Come on, back! If they holler for a prospect, you better get there quick. You don't kind of stumble over there, you run. Whatever you're told to do, you have to do. If it's pick up a dog, tear it off the floor, and eat the you got to do it. Big Larry says prospects aren't required to break the law. If it's not their job, they're not a brother, they're not a patch holder. You don't ask prospects to do anything illegal. There is a loose interpretation of what illegal actually means. One of the duties is to help out patch holders get whatever they want, but also to assault anyone that they tell you to assault. When undercover agent Blake Boulder was prospecting, a patched member ordered him to go after a civilian who was bothering him at a motorcycle rally. He said, prospect, go clock that guy, which in our vernacular means go knock him out. If I don't do what he says, I'm gonna get boot stomped. Blake had just seconds to figure out his next step. If he broke the law, it would mean the end of his case. So as I approach this individual, he sees me coming. He's got a bottle of liquor up to his mouth, and he's just holding it there, watching me approach him. And at this time, I had a 3D cell flashlight, and I pulled that out. And just as I got to him, I swung with all that I was worth, and I just hit that bottle right below his chin. The bottle flew out of the guy's hand, and he toppled over. 
Blake hadn't actually touched him, but hoped he'd made enough of a scene. One of the national vice presidents saw me and told me, Prospect, get over here. He stared at me for a second or two and he said, good job. And then, get out and get to work. Sometimes, it's better to be lucky than good. Only after a prospect makes it through these hurdles and is voted in by 100% of the chapter membership does he get his patch. The Suns award them yearly at Sturgis, their most important mandatory run. It's the members' last chance to torment the prospects, and they make the most of it, even dragging them through the fields in a shovel race. Then the club offers the patch, but only if the prospect can take it away from the entire group. That's about the only time in the club where you're pretty much free to hit anybody. President, enforcer, how bad do you want that patch? Once he's patched in, the new member goes out for his first ride in full colors. Only then is he introduced to the other traditions and rules of the Sons of Silence. The gang's first law is for those who violate their rules. It's called punishment. If you screw up, I mean, it used to say in their old bylaws, it was a beating. That's the punishment. You, you took a beating. It ain't no little f***ing girls club, man. This is f***ing man's club. You're going to up. You're going to take the f***ing man punishment. You don't want to take that? Take your little f***ing squat ass out the f***ing door. Each chapter has an enforcer who keeps people in line. In addition to enforcers, every chapter has a president, a vice president, and a treasurer. There are also national officers who oversee everyone, though they are spread across the Sun's nation. And then there's the gang's special forces unit, the Nomads. We have a Nomad chapter. If things cannot be done by the enforcers or the chapters of their state, town, or whatever, the Nomads will come in. The Nomads are the Grim Reaper. No one wants to see them coming. It's a death squad. They will f***ing take anybody out. No hesitation, no heartbeat, no f***ing blink of an eye. They would just literally f*** you up and kill you. The Suns employ a variety of weapons. We've had automatics, semi-automatics, AKs, pistols, hand grenades. They're there. Members carry two trademark weapons. One is a large industrial flashlight, the kind carried by cops. I wear a kill light. It's a legal weapon to carry because it's a flashlight. You break down, you got a light on the road. Somebody comes after you, you pull it out, you hit them with it. The other is a simple bandana tied to a large lock. Sons carry them in their back pockets. It doesn't look like anything, but on the other end of it, there's a f***ing padlock on there. You can pull that out, man, it's just like a sap, blackjack. You can hit people with it and knock them right the hell out. Weapons aren't the only way to recognize gang members. They all wear gear that brands them as sons, including undercover agent Blake Boatler. This is my Sons of Silence vest that I wore throughout the undercover operation. The vest is covered with patches, each with a different meaning. Down at the bottom is a number 13 patch, and that number 13 designates the 13th letter of the alphabet, which is the letter M. M stands for methamphetamine, the Sons' drug of choice. There are other patches, like SFFS, which stands for Sons Forever, Forever Sons. One of the hardest to get is ITCOV. I took care of business. You had to stand up for the club, put yourself at some sort of a risk um, to get that ITCOV patch. Then there's the bad influence patch. That means that you're just one bad mother 
The Suns also have other gear, like wallets, chains, even rings. They carry big rings that have the Sons of Silence emblems on it. They carry other rings that might say, for example, victim spell backwards. So if they hit somebody in the face, it imprints the word victim. And members also get inked to mark their allegiance. Those who have been in the club for 10 years are eligible for a tat of the club patch. But if they leave in bad standing, the club takes back everything with the son's name on it, even the ink. Hope to God we don't find you, because we will cut the f***er off you. We will cut the f***ing whole thing right off your arm. With a knife, with a razor blade, whatever, we will take it off. Everything is club property. Weapons, patches, even women. They have no status unless they become someone's old lady. Blake Boltler had an old lady of his own when he infiltrated the club in 1998. I had an old lady that wore a property of buckle for me, who happened to be a special agent of ATF. Just to help me out in that role, my story was more like I was rebelling from a wealthy family and was attracted to that type of culture. Carrie DePiro was Blake's backup. It was not an easy assignment for a female ATF agent. You're supposed to just keep your mouth shut, and I was coached by Agent Boltler to keep it zipped, uh, or else he'd have to keep me in line in front of them. If I had a missed slip of the tongue or made any other kind of mistake to give them an idea that either one of us were federal agents, it would have been a fatal mistake for both of us. It didn't make the job any easier. You'll always have to expect the other members to be able to feel like they can take liberties with you. It happened less after Agent Boltler became a patched member than before, and that's when I was able to wear my little belt that says property of Bo, and that's exactly what it means. Carrie wasn't the only ATF agent Blake brought in. He also introduced the sons to his partner, Cole. Together, they began to set up deals that could take the whole club down. They were extremely violent criminals, and they're not to be underestimated. In Colorado Springs, the Sons of Silence are old-school outlaws. Typical dirty bikers. Some have long hair, some have beards, some have tattoos. Some look like just downright dirty, nasty bikers. But then you also you have the clean cut people out there. Okay? The clean cut ones are the ones you have to watch out for the most. Because they're hiding something. ATF agent Blake Boltler was definitely hiding something. He, his girlfriend, and his undercover partner Cole were trying to take down Colorado's largest gang. I was able to buy firearms, explosives, narcotics from other members within the Colorado Springs chapter and other chapters. Blake and Cole began buying large quantities of meth from the gang, while a surveillance camera recorded everything. Here, Blake discusses a meth deal with Steve Cresson, the Suns member who claimed 18 years earlier to have been involved in the murder of the outlaw's national president. Well, okay, uh, on a half on, probably get down to six grand easy. That's what I'm gonna make more money, you know? Blake and his partner also began arranging firearms deals. I think you can get an uh, ATF number for him and register him. This surveillance video shows him negotiating a sale. The fire from the open position. They bought semi-automatic stand guns, illegally modified to make them fully automatic machine guns. Did you pull out right here? Yeah, back. Back there. Oh, you put it there. Good morning. 
Blake's house was a revolving door of drug and firearms deals. As the case progressed, we were having almost daily meetings. This was going on over the weekends, over holidays. As Blake went deeper undercover, the rest of his life took a back seat. He rarely saw his own family. My kids would be scared of the way I looked. Uh, and you were only able to do brief meetings. You couldn't go out in public and eat for fear of running in to a member of the Sons and you'd have to have a story. The stakes were high and got even higher as some became suspicious. Blake's partner Cole almost blew their cover the first time he met Nick Nichols. When I walked in to sit down, Cole, the other fed, said, do you want to set it up no ice, right? I'm like, yeah. Uh, he'd never met me before. I, I thought it kind of strange that he knew what I drank. Either he was really on top of it or he did his homework. Nichols wasn't the only one. In the middle of one gun deal, Blake was confronted by the national president, J.R. Reed. J.R. approached me and asked me, what government agency do you work for with all these guns you've been buying? And I looked him square in the eye and said, uh, I work for the Gun Reclamation Board, and laughed. And he looked at me for just a few seconds, and then he too laughed. And I knew then that he'd bought that. By 1999, Blake and Cole had been working undercover for almost two years. Cole and I talked quite a bit towards the end of the investigation as to when we would close this out. We were both tired. It had been a long two years. In October, the ATF finally decided to conclude the investigation and roll up the Sons of Silence. Warrants were prepared for 21 members of the gang, including longtime national president, J.R. Reed. Finally, on October 7th, Blake went into the gang's clubhouse early in the morning to disable the security systems. I was to take the club shotgun out from behind the bar. I was to disconnect the surveillance cameras, electronic beams that were set up. For the first time in two years, he took off his son's colors and put on his ATF uniform. Only a few hours before, I'd been a patch-wearing son standing in that clubhouse. Now, I was back to who I really am, which is a patch-wearing special agent with ATF. For two days, Blake and the ATF raided Sons of Silence chapters across the state of Colorado. They arrested 43 gang members and associates, seized 59 weapons, four hand grenades, four homemade bombs, a silencer, 10 pounds of methamphetamine, and approximately $30,000. In addition, agents seized the clubhouses in Colorado Springs and Commerce City. The raid stunned the public. I think it opened up people's eyes that, geez, you know, these guys are selling bombs and machine guns and selling all these drugs. They slipped in. They, uh, put a f***ing damper on our When it was over, ATF officials said they had ended the Sons of Silence reign of terror in Colorado. The Sons quietly disagreed. Us, we're bikers. We're the f***ing best of the f***ing best. They didn't take us down, we're still here. In 1999, the ATF took down the Sons of Silence motorcycle gang in Colorado Springs, confident they dealt a fatal blow to the organization.
Then, in 2003, after serving 18 months in prison, J.R. Reed, the gang's president of 22 years, died from heart disease. The whole Suns Nation showed up to pay tribute. Good afternoon. I'm here to preside over the final services of a good friend of ours. They quoted from the Bible, read highly dramatic poetry set to music. Sun, sun, forever, 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 forever sun. sun. And called JR a peacemaker. Your loss and my loss and our loss of a good friend, one who made everyone think they were his best friend. Detective Jim Waddles was in the crowd, keeping an eye on things. He says the description wasn't off the mark, and that the peace JR brokered in 1997 is still holding strong. There's been a couple of little scrums and uh, stuff, but nothing, no major things, no bombings, no shootings, no stabbings, or anything like that. Today, Despite the ATF raid and Reed's death, the Sons of Silence are stronger than ever. Undercover agent Blake Bowler, who put two years into building the ATF's case against the gang, says their numbers are at an all-time high. The Sons of Silence opened up additional chapters in additional states the years following the takedown on this investigation. So at this time, I would estimate that the Sons of Silence are probably larger now than they were back in 1999. Like I said, we are not going to go anywhere. Not everyone has stayed with the gang. Ten-year member Nick Nichols became a born-again Christian. I wanted a break. I wanted some time off. I wanted just to be with my wife. And I asked the club for an early retirement. He still rides bikes, but now wears the patch of a Christian motorcycle club, Church in the Wind. Because we all want the same thing, whether it's a 1% club or party club or a family club or a Christian club, we want to wear our patches. We want to ride with our brothers, and we want to be left alone. Now, the Sons of Silence are being left alone. Jim Waddles has retired from the Denver Police Force. Since then, no one has kept the same close eye on the motorcycle gang. I was working bikers 90% of the time. Um, nobody's taken that over since then. Most of the, the old Denver Police Intelligence files were destroyed um, after I left. You know, my opinion is, being the son of the silence that I am, and Waddles being gone, it's not like having a proctologist up your ass anymore. Waddles occasionally shows up at the Denver Swap Meet, an annual gathering where all the bike clubs sell merchandise and recruit new members. a money-making endeavor for the club. Same with the Banditos and Hells Angels. Did you want to talk to me? No, I'm just down. Good, how are you? Good. Did you get this? Make, oh. make, sure, make sure you get that. The Suns are as secretive as ever and are flying under the radar. If nobody's watching these guys, they're free to do whatever they want. It's a point not lost on the Sons of Silence. We are growing. We will prosper more. We will have more members coming in. We're always looking out for ourselves. The number one, the best, the Sons of Silence, and the story.